Mike, it's so good to see you again. It's very good to see you. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, but look, Mike, since the last time we spoke, I've noticed that your work has just grown. It's tremendously evolving, becoming so much more complex. Your body of knowledge has increased so much. Something I've noticed, I'm not sure if you've picked up on this, but you've become a lot better at articulating these concepts with so much clarity. Have you picked up on this? <laughs> um, no, no, I have no idea. So, so that's great. That's that's good to hear. I hope. I mean, I work on it all the time, but <clears throat> it's actually it's it's hard for me to know what's what you know what's coming across and what's not. So, I'm I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, that's important to me. So, that's great. I, I think it, in that regard, it's very similar to intelligence in general. I mean, it's 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 been, it's been such a spectrum for you that you haven't really noticed or <laughs> picked up on this. Yeah. Tell me, Mike, when you there was a time where you did this paper. I think you wrote an article on. Um, with Daniel Dennett on cognition all the way down. I remember something, I wanted to start this podcast with this concept because I remember you guys discussing the prisoner dilemma and how this illuminates the idea of the computational boundary of the self. I was hoping we could perhaps start with that and then explore these concepts because I find when you ground something with an analogy that people are accustomed to, it becomes a lot easier to understand these complex phenomena. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what I said, but uh, but I can I can I guess I'll, I'll just talk about it. Um, the, uh, when when people do this um, these simulations, these prisoners' dilemma simulations, you know, for for um, uh, economics or uh, game theory or conflict theory or things like that, <clears throat> what typically happens is that let's say let's say we imagine what they call a, a, a spatialized prisoners' dilemma, where you have multiple agents and they all sort of play against their neighbors and and so on. Yeah. The typical way you do this is that there's a constant number of players. So you have some constant number of agents, they all play against each other, they all have individual um, goals, and then you see which strategies are the best over, over time. And the thing about biology is that uh, there's a there's an interesting and oh and 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 of course the moves they, there's two there's two moves they can make. So they can they can at every at every stage of the game, they can cooperate or they can defect. And it's very clear in this in this paradigm, um, each agent is is quite distinct from from the next, and so I can cooperate with with you, or I can defect and not cooperate, and so on, because I know who I am, you know who you are, and so on. <clears throat> in biology, things are not so simple, and it's actually much more interesting because uh, cells and uh, subcellular components, cells, tissues, organs, and so on, can all um, merge in an important way they can connect to each other and form higher level units that have distinct goals memories competencies preferences and so on from the different parts and so <clears throat> i'll just give you a, a simple example uh, in physarum this is slime mold <clears throat> this is actually um it's an experiment that uh, uh my, my son and i did as part of his uh, you know uh, kind of home uh, science uh, a unit um so 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 uh so you have this uh you have the slime mold and you put a piece of oat which the slime mold wants to eat and it starts to crawl towards that oat and then what you can do is you can take a razor blade and and just cut off that leading edge you know the little piece of it that's moving towards the oat now as soon as you've done that that little piece is a new individual and he has a a um a decision to make because he can go and, and get the oat and exploit that resource and not have to share it with this giant mass of, of physarum that's back here. Or he can first merge back and uh and and connect back to the to the original mass because they can reconnect quite easily. And then and then they go get the oat. Now the thing is that the <clears throat> the payoff matrix looks quite different because when it's by itself it can sort of it can it can do this calculus of of well it's better for me to go get the food instead of and not share it with this other thing, <clears throat> but as soon as you connect, you that that payoff matrix changes because there is no me and you there's just we, and at that point it doesn't make any sense to defect you can't defect against yourself, uh, you, you know the, and so th that payoff table of of um, actions and consequences looks quite different because some of the actions change the number of players. Mm. And that's really weird, right? And so that's the thing that normally doesn't happen in typical uh, prisoner's dilemma types of simulations, because all they have is cooperate and defect. There's no way to change the number of players. But we are actually, and I have a student working on this. It's not published yet, so I can't you know, tell you uh, what, what the answers are or anything, because we're still, we're still working on it. But, but we have, a, we have a, a, a version of spatialized prisoner's dilemma where you have cooperate, defect, but also split and merge. 
Mm-hmm. So two cells can decide that. So, and, and when you do that, the, the outcome of your action changes the number of players, which radically changes the payoff table after that. So the whole thing is much more complex, much more sort of, um, this you know uh, recurrent and, and all of that and so and so the question is so so what happens then right what the what what strategies look good under those conditions so um stay tuned for that it'll be some <laughs> months before we know do you have a hypothesis regarding that yeah i i think that uh i think that there will be strategies that uh take advantage of see when, when you merge with another unit you get whatever metabolics they you know whatever whatever metabolic resources they had at that time but more importantly you gain information because that that other individual that you merged with has been sitting there playing against his neighbors for quite some time so so it has lots of information and if you have a good way of merging your information with their information in fact it's a, it's it's inevitable because once you dissolve that boundary you can't tell whose memories are whose anymore that's kind of the big thing about um, that, that that kind of memory wiping the, the the wiping the identity on these memories is a big part of multicellularity i i, I think um and be and and so i think there will be strategies that under specific conditions, take advantage of this merging, and you'll end up with these larger scale individuals that do very well because mm-hmm. they now have the computational capacity, they have the knowledge of of lots of different pieces, and they can and 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 you immediately uh, you know it it sort of forces cooperation. There's mm-hmm. no way for you to defect against yourself really, and so once you're connected that tightly, um, you, you're a larger cooperative unit, I think. And so and so that's what that's what I'm interested in is seeing. Under what conditions uh, and and what policies are optimal for for that kind of thing? Mm. I think it's a fascinating concept because when you take the prisoner's dilemma, you think about the two page the two prisoners. Sorry, um, I mean they're given an ultimatum. I mean, while the options are one is you you either tell the judge, I would say, or the police officer that you did commit the crime and then you take the blame. The other guy goes scot free, or vice versa. And the other two options are obviously one. If both of them just don't say anything and they get a much shorter sentence or both of them rat out one of the, one of the others and then they get no sentence um and then when you take that and incorporate it into cells and people human beings it's easy for us to look at us and think okay we're 30 trillion human cells give or take we're about 39 trillion bacterial cells at what point do we consider ourselves bacteria or at what point do we consider ourselves human perhaps these questions are incorrect and you do a great job at explaining this uh, with your computational boundary of self, you want to explore that a bit? Yeah. Um, well, uh, so so the, my my computational boundary of the self notion is simply a way to try to be able to think about very diverse kinds of uh, beings, diverse kinds of intelligences, all all on one scale, so to speak. So 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 often people are interested in the brain structure or very specific behaviors in specific environments, which makes it very hard to <clears throat> then compare and contrast these kinds of agents mm-hmm. to ones that either don't have a brain or work in a completely different space. <clears throat> and so I wanted I wanted some kind of a framework that enables you to think about what do all intelligent agents have in common? And so we're talking about uh, agents that are either very large or very tiny, so so molecular scale or perhaps uh, planetary or larger scale, very short-lived things, very long-lived um, uh, kinds of uh, kinds of uh, the agents that are very hard for 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 humans to typically recognize as intelligent, ones that work in weird spaces. So not just behavior in three-dimensional space, but behavior in uh, physiological space, gene expression space, uh, anatomical morphous space. You know, we're talking about uh, things that are evolved, designed, uh, things that are some combination, a hybrid of, uh, of of those things. So, and and so and so the framework that I came up with, and this was, um, we we were we were challenged to do this by uh, Pranab Das at the uh, uh, at, at a Templeton meeting back in I think 2018 or or something like that. Uh, the the framework that I wanted to use was was this idea that what all of these agents have in common is the ability to pursue goals, mm-hmm. and some of them have very sophisticated ability to pursue goals. Some of them have very simple ones, but and and this this is not a new idea. This goes all the way back. Uh, well, it goes even further. But but William James said it very well when he said 
uh, you know, intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. Mm. And, and he talked about the spectrum of, you know, two magnets trying to get together versus Romeo and Juliet trying to get together and everything in between. And, and what does it mean to have competencies to get around various obstacles and, and things that uh, are, are preventing you from reaching your goals? So the so 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 my framework is simply that you can draw um, on a two dimensional uh, sort of uh, grid. You can map out the scale of the largest goal that an individual agent can pursue. Mm -hmm. So you it's sort of a it's, it's almost like a Minkowski diagram where you collapse all of space onto one axis. Time is is the other axis, and you can you can draw the radius of the goals, not not the radius at which something has sensory capacity or can take actions, but the size of the goal states that they can pursue. So if you're a if 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 um, all of your goal states are about local uh, local sugar concentration right now. You're probably a bacterium or something similar. <clears throat> if your goal state, uh, if 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 you have, um, you know, a dog might have uh, some memory going back or some predictive capacity going forward, but they're never going to care about what happens a month from now, three towns over. It's just impossible, the right? As far as we know, um, and this, all of this, of course, is, is these are empirical questions. We don't know ahead of time until we test it what creatures can and can't uh, uh, pursue as goals. But you know, we it's likely that something like a dog has a has a radius that uh, has a a, a, a well defined uh, kind of time horizon and 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 space spatial uh, boundary, and beyond that, it's it's not going to care, right? Um, and, 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 you know, and if, and if you care about what happens to the earth, uh, uh, thousands of years from now, what happens to the human race, uh, well, you know, what, what world peace and the financial markets uh, in the next century, you're probably a human because th these are, these are gigantic uh, kind of cognitive light cones. Um, and then, and then, you know, if, <clears throat> if you're some, some alien species that has the ability to literally care about every other being on your planet right in the linear range i mean humans i don't think can do that but 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 if there is a creature somewhere that is that level of advance where they can actually have care and compassion for for every being and they work towards it they would have a much larger cognitive light cone than we do you know more more advanced in that way and so 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 that's the idea right and 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 that idea leads you to develop um uh, practical uh, uh, experimental tools to 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 look for the the size of the boundary for any given agent, and so you can ask for cells, for tissues, for organs, for swarms. What problem space are they working in? In that problem space, what are the goals that they're trying to reach? What are the size of those goals, and what are the competencies? How good are they at getting those goals met when things change? Yeah, when in the novel per novel perturbations, novel environments, and so on. And then you can do experiments, and and that's really key. Yeah, that that all of this. This is not philosophy. This is this is meant to advance empirical research by by focusing the questions on. Uh, uh, people will specify hypotheses about what goals a particular system can reach, and then we may do experiments, and then we find out that yes, it can get around certain kinds of uh, perturbations, but not others. And and then and, and then we know who's right and who's wrong. Something like a very common theme regarding your work. I mean, there's a lot of people who, on the one hand, don't like this idea of of scientists diving into this or diving into this philosophy realm and and, and trying to take over this this mm. niche of thinking or thought processes but then on the other side you've got many philosophers people like dennett in general who love this idea of 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 scientists coming into their field and teaching them so many new concepts i mean your goal you make it very clear is it's not i think i wrote it down here it's it's not to anthropomorphize morphogenesis the point is to naturalize cognition and I think that's pretty cool. It's a great way to sort of frame this process. How do you feel this has been received from the scientific community, from a philosophical perspective, perhaps? Yeah. Well, and 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 I I can't speak for for everybody. You know, in all these communities, I you know I have no idea. I don't I don't uh, <clears throat> I don't generally monitor too much what uh, what, what you know how people react to stuff. So so I, I don't know exactly. But 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 I'll tell you what I think. Um, from from the limited the kind of data sample that I have. Um. I think that uh, I think that some of these ideas really catch a lot of flack from both sides, which is interesting. So, so people who are very is sort of they have a very uh, molecular based uh, reductionist or bottom up kind of perspective, you know, very very you know physical oriented. They tend to not like this because they don't want 
aspects of of um, uh, kind of mental talk uh, getting back into uh, you know they 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 feel that we should we should do, get as far as possible away from agential kinds of uh, kinds of vocabulary that this is sort of uh, pre scientific magical thinking and that and that uh, you know the promise that they that they sort of make to us is that. Um, don't worry. At some point, we can we can everything will be nicely explained at the level of molecules. Mm. Um, you know, it's kind of it's it's not real reductionism in that they typically don't want to go below molecules, so nobody feels like they should be talking about quantum foam. They just kind of want want to. They like chemistry and 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 they want to talk about molecules, but um, but but they've picked their level and they think that's it, and that we shouldn't we shouldn't be talking about things that. Uh, uh, well, what do things want, and uh, you know, what do agents remember, and do the agents have and 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 so and so they don't they don't like this stuff for the, for that reason. Um, f- funny enough, the opposite camp, which are the organicists who have been fighting this for for hundreds of years <clears throat> and arguing about the fact that no, in fact, some some things in the world, in fact, biology and living things and maybe ecosystems and cells and whatnot, uh, you know, they they do have uh, these kind of uh, agential properties, and we need to we absolutely need to not um, uh, uh, explain that away or pretend it doesn't exist. Those people really um, often tend to get upset with me, too, because uh, th- th- what they don't like is the fact that I have what they call machines on mm-hmm. the same spectrum. And so they feel that if we put machines what, what and, and defining what a machine is, is really non-trivial. But 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 they feel that if we put some of these simpler mechanisms like like what currently we recognize as machines on the same spectrum, that it's a slippery slope to uh, losing whatever magic, whatever um uh, respect we're supposed to have for for these uh, for, the, for these incredible uh, living living beings, and that and that they feel very strongly that we need to keep a sharp binary distinction between machines and living organisms. Um, I I, th- I think that's profoundly wrong, and I think um, you know the 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 challenge and the opportunity here is precisely to develop a um, a, a, a principled science of, of a continuum that mm-hmm. tells us what in, in what cases are you better off using the tools of simple machines and in what cases are you better off using the tools of complex cognitive beings and everything in between. We have lots of tools all across that spectrum and uh, and, and I think it is the same spectrum. And anytime you ask somebody to define what they mean by machine, mm-hmm. they either... T- t- you know, from in this in the context of this kind of debate, they typically either have no definition or they have one that would have been good eh, maybe in the 1950s, but certainly not after that. And so I th- I think that binary distinction and Josh Bongard and I have, have written on this very specifically that, that I I, th- I think this binary distinction uh, is just is just completely and uh, you know uh, it leads to all sorts of pseudo problems. It it doesn't help uh, research. It's uh, you know it's a non-starter. So we we really do need to naturalize all of this and and show that that uh, that there is a single continuum and that we need to develop tools across all, all across that continuum and have an empirical research program of when do you deploy each particular tool and when does it work for you and so on. You know, I, I think I completely agree with you regarding almost everything you you just said because we, often when people ask specific questions specifically regarding consciousness, I mean, this podcast is called Mind Body Solution. Obviously, paying homage to the mind body problem what is consciousness becomes a very fundamental question. But I often think about it, like consciousness is is more like a verb. It's, it's not really something that's an on off switch. Um, it, it's very difficult to put that switch on um, in general when we talk about anything. So, so when you're talking about cognition, intelligence, the self, do you think it's becoming harder to explain these concepts because of this lack of a definition? Or do you think it becomes more and more exciting to discuss these concepts because of this continuum of, of exploration? Well, I, I certainly think it's we're in a better place now than we were. I think uh, I think I think it's it is it is exciting and it's getting better. But um, you know, specifically with the issue of consciousness, so so I so I've been pretty careful up until now to say very little about consciousness per se. Right, I, I mostly talk about very very functional, um, publicly observable behavior. So so intelligent behavior as problem solving and um, you know these these cognitive uh, capacities that are kind of like. Um, uh, uh, experimentally observable uh, third person kind of science and so so that was on purpose not 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 but 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 not because i you know it's not that i don't think consciousness is an important problem i think it's it's an extremely important problem i, I don't think it, it doesn't exist uh i don't think that the mind body kind of uh, issues are not important they are but i do think it's 
important to make as much progress as we can uh, on quote unquote easy problems without immediately uh, sort of um, uh, combining them with with extremely difficult problems, right? And so and so I, you know once once you start talking about consciousness things get off the rails very quickly. And so so I've wanted to for most of my stuff, which up until now has not really needed to talk about consciousness per se. I wanted to kind of let that stuff cook in its own area that doesn't that doesn't get into all of those issues about consciousness. Um, but I do think it's an important problem. I am writing some stuff about it now that should hopefully be out, uh, I don't know, probably early 24. Um, and I think, I guess, I guess the only thing I'll, I'll say about it now is that... <clears throat> Typically, uh, you know, when when people talk about consciousness, they typically, not everybody, but but often people think about the sort of input side of things, meaning what the, what the, you know the, the standard uh, def, the standard definition is what does it feel like to be a whatever you know a bat or or a human robot or whatever you know what's it like to what's it like to be so they focus on the experience, which is the kind of sensory side, if you will. Um, and 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 what I think what I think is is probably more. I mean, they're both important, but the, but the thing that's that needs more emphasis is the actuation side. It's the action side. What is it like to do to be a to be an agent that has the ability to do things? And and the, and and the reason the reason I think I think this isn't getting any attention is this: there is a there is a theory of mind called epiphenomenalism, and in epiphenomenalism, you sort of assume that okay. Uh, you, you know, you can say that yes, these um, these uh, uh, conscious sensory states that I have are real, but they don't do anything. So, so the input side is real, but there is no output side. It's a view. I'm not saying I support it, but but it's it's a view. What doesn't exist, to my knowledge, is the opposite side. I've never seen, I've never heard anybody have a view that says, well, the action part is real, the free will is real, but the sensory stuff is is an is an illusion, right? I, I've never heard of that of that view. So the fact that there's only one, you know, it's not symmetric. There's only one one version of this tells you that people are very much into the um, kind of perception side and not so much into the action side. And 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 I mean, I mean, some obviously are people who work on active inference and things like that. Of course, pay pay attention to both sides of the equation. But but I think I think that that is really the mark of the agent is sure what does it feel like but more even more importantly what do I do next that's really what what drives all of this is that is that uh, I need to know what to do next what what's what's my next move as an agent and that that I think is 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 really fundamental to being and and I think it's going to be fundamental to the consciousness problem too it's going to be it's it's much of it is all of the decisions about where is the boundary between you and the outside world and, and all these kinds of things that are, that are fundamental to defining yourself and what are you, you know, and all of those are driven by the need to act, to choose a next action. And so, so that's, that's kind of where, where I look at. Well, I'm looking forward to your work on consciousness. I mean, I'm obviously excited for it. Are you able to give a precise definition of what you say consciousness is at this point? Uh, no. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it goes against, I mean, what we just spoke about, giving a precise definition in that way yeah. is pretty much impossible. I, I, I mean, definitions are good. Uh, there's kind of a trade-off between, I mean, you definitely don't want to talk about things without having some definition. I, I This happens all the time. I hear a lot of people talking about um, sentience, you know, whether it be plant sentience or robot sentience, is that thing can't be sentient. I'm like, uh, have you got a definition of what you mean? Because that's a really hard thing to define, really. Um, so, so definitions are, are important. At the same time, I think that too, too early in the game, trying to come up with a with a with a very you know strict definition early in the game, and I do think we're still early in that game, even though people have been thinking about this for thousands of years. Um, nevertheless, um, what what I what I will say about it is is this: I think that I I, th I think that. Uh, we need to be clear, and and I think Dennett talks about this in in one of his papers. This idea of a bait and switch. You know, mm -hmm. you you say you're going to talk about consciousness, but what you really end up doing is telling a story about physiology and behavior, right? And so and so, I really think we need to um, keep clear. If you think if th th there there's all the science that we can do in third person, and the mark of science that you do in third person is that you don't change much, if at all, doing the experiment. So you do a certain experiment, and maybe you learn something, which in the, which does change you a little bit. But 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 you're still the same. You're 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 standing away from the experiment at some distance, so so to speak. Um, you're you're still whoever you are. You made you 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 know you've done the experiment and you've learned something. 
Mm. Uh, if you're going to work on consciousness, there's no way to do third per I, I don't believe there's any good way to do third person research on consciousness. It's, ve it's very hard. Mo mo most people who do that are really studying physiology and behavior. If you're going to do actual experiments on consciousness, you're part of the experiment. You, you are going to be changed by that experiment. So for example, um, if you want to know what it's like to be something, <clears throat> the only the only actual way that you're going to get that level of information is to, in some important way, merge with that agent. So maybe we connect brains in some way, right? Uh, you know, some now 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 if you and I connect our brains, I don't find out what it's like to be you, and you don't find out what it's like to be me. Instead, we find out what it's like to be us. That's so it. it's not quite the same. But nevertheless, th that's as close as you're going to get. And otherwise, you know, I can. Uh, it, 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 I, I think I described this at the end of the of, of my tame paper, where um, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine like doing pure third person neuroscience, where you get some electrodes stuck in somebody's brain, and you're sort of reading on a screen, and then you decide that you know what this this screen and and all this stuff, it's a low low bandwidth. I really need to get in there, and so you have you know some kind of a brain interface on your own that's that's uh, d delivering the data right into your brain, and then eventually you say, yeah, that, that that's not good enough either. I'm just going to fuse my brain directly to to this other brain, and and you can do that, you know, by with with the bioengineering, um, and then. Uh, then 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 now 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 you're into first person science right and so you use you, you sort of smoothly and 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 that's experiments with uh i don't know people talk about experiments with psychedelics and yes. and meditation and uh, personal development and whatever studying consciousness you're not going to be the same coming out of it as you went in that's i think the the only way that you can really study consciousness per se well i think that with it in that regard you are one step close i mean chum has often said the best way to sort of approach a problem is defining it is defining the problem within the problem in itself. So like understanding that there is a problem, which in your case seems to be this action dilemma. I mean, it seems to be, no one seems to be incorporating that sort of agential action nature behind it. It reminds me of something Kevin Mitchell says in one of his books, free agents. He talks about, I move, therefore I am. Is that a yeah. lot of lines of what yeah. you're yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 exactly right. And all, all the work on um, uh, uh, active inference, uh, to, to, you know, I didn't mean to say that nobody's paying attention to it. I just meant that it's, uh, you know, in the general, you know, kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the field of people who think about this stuff, there's a lot more emphasis on the on the internal perceptions and, and so on than, than on the actions. But yeah, I think I think that's right. I think it's movement. And, and I would um, I would extend that to. Uh, say that it's movement not just in three-dimensional space which mm -hmm. is we it's easy for us to recognize but it's movement in other problem spaces so changes of gene expression figuring out well what gene do i turn on next uh changes in morphogenesis um you know how many fingers should should this arm have and should we be an arm at all or should we be a leg or a foot uh and uh um, movement in in metabolic space movement in physiological space who knows you know linguistic space so there's all kinds of other spaces Mm, yeah, the, the necessity to act in all these spaces defines who or what you are based on what you have, what you have control over and what the, you know, what you also, of course, the recursive self model of, of what, what you think you have control over and so on. You, you just reminded me of another one, because uh, I said, Kevin says, I am, I, I move, therefore I am. Carl Freston says, I am, therefore I think. And, and, and it sort of, sort of interplays with it. When I spoke to Carl, he, he was telling me about your work your upcoming work and the work that Chris Fields, Mark Solms, all you guys are doing some amazing work in these fields. Um, what excites you about this at the moment? And what, what are you guys currently, what's this main goal at the moment? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just excited. I mean, what are, what a group of people to be part of, right? Yeah. Like I'm just thr thrilled to death to be able to work with Chris and Carl and Mark. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing minds. Um, uh, I'm chatting, yeah, what, I'm chatting to Mark next week. Uh, we've spoken before. We're both from Cape Town. So, I mean, I'm, you guys are doing some incredible stuff. All separately, very different work. But when it comes together, it seems like such a culmination of, of joy from my perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it because I think that um, uh, we have a chance to say something quite rigorous about what minds are and where they come from. The, th the thing is that for, you know, for how many thousands of years, various pre-scientific human societies have had this idea that 
uh, you know, there's a spirit in each rock and every tree has a, you know, you can, you know, the environment is a being and the, all the trees and all the rocks and everything. So it's one thing to say that, but it's something else to have a rigorous quantitative model that tells you how much, right? What kind and how much. So here's a, here's a, here's a, a system and it might be a rock and it might be a computer and it might be some sort of robot or a synthetic, uh, you know, synthetic biobot or whatever, whatever. But to really have the tools to be able to say, okay, uh, what what kind of cognition and how much is here, and how do I how do I best relate to this agent? What's the most effective way of relating to them? What's the most ethical way of relating to them? Um, to finally start to develop some tools that allow you to do that in a really principled way, I think is a, is a huge advance over the old insight that you know mind is everywhere. Like that's the, that's a good first you know zero order uh, pass at this. But but now but now we're actually um, able to 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 make that much more specific, much more defensible, um, actually integrated into the rest of science, because this is I feel very strongly about this, that these ideas are not just things that you can have philosophical arguments about. And then some people say some people, you know, I've, I've heard this too. Uh, I'll give a talk. And then some people say, uh, wow, uh, we, we, we love the new data and the new capabilities, but we wish you'd stop talking about all this philosophical stuff. Like it's, 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 it's like, we, we, you know, we don't like it. It's just stop talking about all that, just do the experiment. And, and my point is, yeah, no, there's a reason why nobody did these experiments before. Mm -hmm. And that's because the philosophy is actually really critical to be, being able to have these kinds of ideas. Right. And so um, <clears throat> making all this testable and uh, connected to the rest of the scientific enterprise where, you know, for example, my, 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 you know, unusual views on uh, cellular agency and all that, they actually have specific implications for regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. And if you're into regenerative medicine, you can't really ignore all this stuff. It, it's, it's part of, you know, and, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll be, you know, even more um, uh, uh, kind of uh, impactful if once, once we, you know, once we get closer to actual uh, clinical applications. So, so, so I, I'm just super excited. I think, I think each of these uh, people that you mentioned has a really uh, amazing grasp on multiple fields, you know, so, so, so physics and uh, um, in the case of Mark, uh, you know, uh, psychoanalysis and, and, and stuff like that, which I think is very important, co you know, computation and, and biology. Uh, th this is the most exciting area I think there is in science right now is this, this weaving together of these, of these different areas to, to find out what is uh, common to, to different kinds of minds and how do we recognize them and how do we build them and how do we relate? Is, oops, is there a name for this project? I mean, it seems like such, like almost like superheroes coming together. This is like an Avengers assembling <laughs> to sort of conquer the mind. It's, it, that's what it feels like to someone like me who's been watching this part of it somehow, but also watching it from the outside. I mean, what, what are you guys do, really doing? What's, what's the end goal here at least? Um, I, I love that idea. Maybe, maybe I can get, <laughs> Uh, mid journey to, to to make a to make an Avenger style poster with these guys that would be that would be fun. Um, let's see. Uh, well, is there a name for it? Um, is there a name and who's part of the team and what what's really happening? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, so 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 I think I think one way to name this field is uh, the is it's a field of diverse intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, the field of diverse intelligence has lots of. I mean, I'm certainly it's not my job to uh, to say who's in and who's out of what mm -hmm. team. There are, there are many people uh, that that work on diverse intelligence, right? So you got you got people who work on decoding whale songs and 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 various philosophers, and you've got people doing uh, minimal matter. So you know these droplets that run mazes and that do you know min minimal active matter and stuff like that. Um, molecular chemotaxis. I don't know if, if you've seen some of these papers. Just amazing, you know. You got these individual molecules that can do chemotaxis instead of bacteria doing doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so so this field is this field is huge and and highly diverse as it should be. Um, and so I, I like, to, if I have to boil it down, sometimes when people ask, I'll say it's a field of diverse intelligence research. Uh, yeah. And many people are doing, you know, many different things. I think that each of the people that you named has their own research agenda in addition to the stuff that we're doing together. Uh, I, all I can talk, really talk about is what I think uh, the, the goal here is. And to me, the goal is to establish a, a firm uh, rigorous foundation for understanding the spectrum between 
what we call matter and um, what we call mind. I think it's a continuum. I think that the the, the biggest question for of, of all is this idea of of how minds come to be and how and how do they scale in our physical universe. And for me, it's it's to take insights on that question and use them to drive applications that improve people's embodied experience in the world. So that means that means regenerative medicine, that means bioengineering, that means uh, you know environmental remediation, all of the all of the things that uh, will improve the lived experience for all all living living beings and so so practical applications of these really fundamental questions. Um, I, th I think we're all sort of working uh, towards that in some in some way. I was curious to ask. I mean, when, when Carl mentioned this, my first thought was, I mean, I know how complicated the academic system is in general, getting grants, getting research done. Um, you guys are all working on such different and diverse topics in general. How is this accumulation going to occur? I mean, is there some sort of linkage between all of this or are you guys going separate parts, doing separate work and bringing it all together somehow afterwards? Or is this sort of a cumulative journey as well? In terms of um, it, well, it's it's everything. So it's it's both. So all of them and everybody else in this field has their own uh, uh, research programs that they're pushing forward, um, but we all collaborate and um, there are uh, many different collaborations going on. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm part of some of them, but obviously there are many others that I don't know about. Uh, and yeah, and we work together. So 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 Mark and Carl and Chris and I, we we work together and we write papers together. Um, and so, so yeah, I think I think this stuff is, is pulling together, and there are many other, many many other people. I'm I, I'm super excited how many young people are coming into this field. So this is this is the sort of thing where you can very clearly see that uh, a lot of the resistance that some of the big names in this field and this you know some of the traditional people is matched by the excitement of some extremely bright young people coming into this field that are not um, constrained in the same way. And uh, as 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 previous uh, you know kind of previous folks, and uh, and I think and I think that's very exciting. I think this is going to this is a very rapidly growing field, and people are getting into it. And and so many I I, I received so many um, uh, emails and uh, <clears throat> from people that have come across this work, and and they've sort of you know changed their 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 educational trajectory to kind of enable them to 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 go in this in this area. It's it's very exciting. I also, I'm so I'm looking forward to so many new thinkers coming into the field because I was speaking to someone about this not too long ago. And when you think about the average student today, I mean, these guys know how to program, they know how to write code. They they, they speak so many diverse languages already. So they're coming into this these topics with far more than the average, let's say, philosopher and neuroscientist today in their peak has. So it, it must be super exciting to also look down at some of these guys' presentations, knowing what they want to come up with. Um, do you often get that in a day-to-day -day basis when your students come to you with these phenomenal ideas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not only my own students, but others. I mean, I get a lot of emails from from people all over the you know students all over the world, uh, ones who are attached to, to some lab and many who are not attached, and so on. S some of them are you know so far ahead of me in terms of uh, their mathematical understanding and and things like that, and 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 so on, which is which is fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think very exciting and. Uh, you know, well, part of the challenge is, and I, I spend a lot of time actually with 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 these people who who contact me for this, who who, who need this kind of thing. Uh, the challenge is to maintain that level of creativity mm. while going through the traditional academic educational system, because it it it, it has a way of uh, uh, um, sanding down the you know the interesting bits, uh, kind of so to speak, and. And, and grinding people down in an important way, you know, some, some, you know, some very in practical ways by making them spend time on, on specific things. And some, uh, in some ways, just, uh, you know, intellectually because of feedback they get from, from traditional, uh, you know, tra traditional thinkers and so on. Um, it's, 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 it's a challenge, you know, it's a challenge. And so, some of these people are so incredibly bright. It's actually difficult for them to navigate the system with, with us average, you know, sort of Joe's, uh, and some of whom, and 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 and, and you know, many people um, can be quite uh, in this in this field. You know, you need a thick skin, right? This is uh, a lot of people can be can be pr pretty pretty hostile, you know, and, and mean. And 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 when you're young, you have to you have to learn pretty quickly to uh, you yeah. know kind of let let that roll off. You know, I mean, I can only imagine the difficulty they're faced with because I mean, just even as as a medical doctor, when if I talk to people within the medical field about differences in 
consciousness. I mean, they only think about it from a quantifiable perspective, level of consciousness. That's it. Um, <laughs> the attention they pay to the contents of consciousness or experience in general, it's not as vast. I mean, life or death. It's 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 the, the binary exclusion, living versus non-living, cell versus non no cell. Uh, it's a very clear pattern, the way they sort of train, get trained and how you're forced to think at that point. It, it's very much ingrained into you from the very beginning. Uh, you feel that this is a big hindrance with us uh, in general, and then and then your work's clearly trying to push towards a more diverse view of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't have much to say about um, specifically medical education yeah, no, because no. I'm not an MD and I haven't been through med school and so on. But um, uh, although I did my PhD at a medical school, uh, so so I kind of know a little bit about it. But but the thing is that there are there are a lot of incentives. Uh, not to think in new ways mm. and a lot of very strong personalities uh who will give young people advice on how to think and what to think about and and what i tell my students leaving the lab is there there's basically two kinds of advice there's specific advice on specific experiments and and approaches and and cr those cr those kind of criticisms that's gold right so so you need to pay a lot of attention to that because because it helps you um, uh, hone your craft and get better at what you're doing, and so so any critiques of very specific um, experiments or lines of reasoning or whatever like that's great. Then then there's the other stuff which is kind of the meta advice. But and by the way, everything I'm saying now is an example of that. So you you know mm -hmm. people should maybe feel free to ignore that too. But 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 the, but the meta advice is uh, do this, don't do that. Think of it this way. Don't think of it that way. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. Yeah. Th that kind of stuff. I feel. Uh, Hardly anybody is um, well. Well, first of all, no one has a crystal ball, okay. And we are all calibrated on the things we are interested in. And we, you know, successful successful people are very well calibrated on whatever it is that they care about, and, and they're successful in that field. That doesn't mean anything about whether they're ca calibrated on your ideas, right? And and it's and in fact, I I've found that a lot of um, pioneers who have had brilliant ideas and have fought through and you know, sort of um, uh, uh, spent a lot of energy in their life uh, pushing some 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 new idea. Those people are often the most resistant to other new ideas. It's amazing. I, I didn't know that when I was young, but <clears throat> I really, you know, I, I kind of thought that somebody somebody who was such an avant garde thinker in this way would surely they like my new idea. No, they they often don't. They like their new idea, but 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 they've spent all their energy fighting for that idea, and they want everything else to be kind of you know uh, uh, a consensus and standard, and that's just you know what i what i tell my students is be very careful with people who are very smart and very successful they know their stuff they're not necessarily calibrated on your stuff they don't know yeah. what you know what you should and shouldn't do so so it's so um you know and 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 so and, and a lot of people are are well meaning and 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 uh, generous with um with with knowledge and so on and that's great and and some people aren't <clears throat> and so you just need to you need to have a thick skin and you need to keep you know sort of your goal in mind and just uh you know um get better at what you do. Um, i've written so many notes and I, we've steered away from the conversation at this point but it's too fascinating to not to just delve a little bit deeper when you think about okay when you were doing this you had a lot of mentors you had lots of people you were looking up to while in this field who, were there anyone people in anyone in specific like particular that you can think of who really got you here uh, from a mental perspective, really influenced you and motivated you to to do this work. Yeah, well, I suppose let's stick with the uh, living people because I have you know there's a whole. I actually when when you come into my lab up on the wall, I've got pictures of I don't know probably about a dozen uh, mm -hmm. people who I consider my heroes. Um, who are and, uh, I'm curious uh, to know. Well, I we can. I'll actually um, I'll send you a link later. There's a there's a I I, I tweeted at some point uh, actually the pictures and some text about each one. So I'll I'll put up a, I'll put up a link later. But um, uh, but 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 uh, if we if we talk about uh, you know so so my first um, undergraduate uh, mentor who uh, I was a computer science student and she she took me into her lab and allowed me to do bio the the first. Um, real biology experiments. I, mean, I had done stuff at home, but this was like you know real, real biology. Her, her name was Susan Ernst, um, and she was a bio. She was here at Tufts, um, uh, developmental biologist, and uh, my PhD mentor Cliff Tabin and my postdoc mentor um, uh, Mark Mercola. You know they were they were um, amazing mentors, all of them. The thing is that at, at the, by 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 then 
I had sort of already gotten the idea that it's it's often better not to say too much. And so I went through those stages, uh, not really talking about any of the things that I'm, you know, these these kinds of things, right? I kind of kept my mouth shut. So um, the people, the the other people that uh, w- w- uh, that really have had an influence on me, um, one was Don Ingber, who's uh, he's um, you know kind of a huge figure in in biomechanics and 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 the uh, the the director of the Wies Institute at Harvard. He was one of the few people. Uh, very few people um, early on when I was a grad student there at, at Harvard Medical School who was supportive of me and having new ideas. He was he was pretty much the only person I'd ever talked to about some of this you know crazy stuff. Um, and, and he was he was one of the few people that was actually positive about yeah you you should not give this up you should keep you know you should keep thinking about it it's fine that everybody else thinks it's nuts like that's okay um you know hone your craft and 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 so on um you know another, another person is lens on so lens on works on cancer and zebrafish also at harvard med school um uh just just the most amazingly supportive uh you know top of the line researcher but just really really supportive really kind um yeah that's that's very important you know having having people like that is is re- is really important. Yeah, I'm just making notes of their names because I want to check their work out as well. Uh, you mentioned a couple things. Uh, you mentioned tame technological approach to mind every, which at some point I want to touch on. But uh, in keeping with Mark, I remember once you and him having a conversation about homeostasis in general. And I mean, this seems to be a very important asset or facet, sorry, of of what we're trying to achieve. These goal oriented behaviors. It's clearly a, a way to get us um, homeostatic in a sense. At some point, you and Mark, you don't necessarily disagree, but I remember him mentioning the fact that, okay, he does consider this to be a very ancient process. It's been happening back in time for millennia, and it still happens from birth to to adulthood, I would say. But he's concerned that at some point, your approach becomes a little bit more panpsychist with this technological approach from, uh, of mind everywhere. Uh, how, do you, how do you see it? Do you see it becoming that way at any point, or, or how have you really began to frame, the, frame this philosophically? Um, I don't, I don't disagree that it's, that it's panpsychist, um, except that there's, there's two different ways to do panpsychism. The the traditional way is to say, here's all of traditional physics and all of standard normal physics. And also I'm going to paint some stuff onto these electrons and things that are, you know, sort of little tiny hopes and dreams that the, that the electrons have. Right. So that's one, that's one way of doing it. That's I, I don't, I don't like that way. And that's the, that's the thing that most people I think have in mind when they object to panpsychism um, because having a perfectly good physics that works and then saying, okay, now I'm going to add a bunch of stuff to it. That doesn't do anything, but the, you know, it's sort of there. Uh, yes. That's that I think is, is problematic, but there's a, another way. And I think um on, I mean, I don't know, but I think that uh, at this point, Mark, probably I, I would think that, uh, that doesn't disagree with this, but but maybe, you know, we can we can ask him. I'll be seeing him next week so we can ask him. I'm going to chat um, this week. So hopefully you got, it's either you chat before him, but then I'll ask him afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can we can talk about this. Um, The 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 other uh, the other type of panpsychism is what Chris and and and, um, and Carl Friston are doing, which is <clears throat> to reformulate basic physics as fundamentally first a, uh, a, a, a protocognitive process. See, that's a completely different, different kettle of fish, because what you're saying there is it's not that the traditional physics is a, okay. And I want to, I want to add some stuff to it that we don't really need. What you're saying is no, actually traditional physics is a, um, uh, a, 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 an edge case of systems that have, a a, a, a certain level of, of cognition, but actually those systems and, and also all the very complex stuff eventually leading up to humans and beyond uh, are actually features of a much of, of a deeper underlying reality. And, and that one I like much better. I think that's a kind of panpsychism that I, that I uh, would support. And the other key thing is in my mind, uh, the, the useful thing about panpsychism is that it needs to be, uh, it needs to have an empirical component. So mm-hmm. when somebody says, you know, well, how about this rock? Does this rock have have a mind? Yes. Well, how about this one? Oh, definitely. Well, what's the difference? I don't know. So right. So so that that doesn't work. But 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 having a um uh, an empirical set of tools that tell you under what conditions do you ascribe different kinds of minds to specific uh, systems. 
right? And what, 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 how, why, you know, what, what's a, what's a principled way to ascribe mind to, and what kind of mind, and so on. Th that's that's really key. So, so you need a panpsychism that isn't a philosophical position, and that's why that's why Tame um, has the word engineering in it because. I really think, and 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 by the way, I don't think engineering is the end all and be all of, of human existence for sure. But but I think we can get very far with an engineering perspective, which says you need to have a practical, you know, whatever whatever concepts you're you're pushing have to have a practical implication, and they need to help you do better in the real world. Right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the beauty of engineering is that we get to find out who's right and who's wrong by by doing experiments and by seeing what these various views allow you to do what what do they facilitate for research and so on when it comes to panpsychism i mean philip goff's often spoken about in this realm of panpsychism is there any point with his philosophy where you completely disagree or do you feel like his philosophy will sort of fit into your scientific worldview somehow uh, uh, I must say, I, I don't know everything that he says. So I think I need to, uh, in fact, I, I have it, uh, you know, on my calendar to uh, try and get a conversation with him and really sort of drill down to see where, where we agree and disagree. So I don't know. Um, the, the reason why I'm asking is because I asked Caldas and I, and I found it very fascinating because th there is that <laughs> element behind the philosophical process behind the science, science behind this, but when I, when I put forward this idea, if we, when you think about these prior information that you take in and you make out these posterior conclusions, if you take illusionism as a theory of consciousness, which I'm starting to see and empathize with what Philip was once saying, he once mentioned that if not for panpsychism, he feels that illusionism as a theory of consciousness or this introspective illusion on how we perceive this is the most coherent argument when he does not consider his own of panpsychism. I've been thinking, how can you go jump from consciousness everywhere to nothing at all? But then when I asked Cole about this, I said, if the prior information cons consistently tells us we're conscious, um, we're not conscious, sorry. Sorry, if, if the prior information tells us that we are conscious, um, but yet we don't technically have this definition for what consciousness is. And if we're slowly blurring this line, at some point, wouldn't it be okay to then say that we, there is an illusion happening here? There is no definite essence of consciousness, per se but there is this definitive continuum of experience that we don't really have an answer to. In that case, would it then be considered a version of illusionism? He basically said yes, but I don't think I'm really explaining it as well as I should. <laughs> well, uh, the, thing, the thing about illusions is uh, let's, let's try to define it. And, and in order to define it, we need to think about what the alternative would be. Hmm. And it's, it's similar to sometimes people ask me, uh, is it possible that we're living in a simulation that all this is, you know, that reality isn't what we, and, and if you think about it, it's not just possible, it's guaranteed. There's no other way it could possibly be because, because if you think about, you know, what, what is the opposite of that? The opposite of that is that um, you somehow have a, a, a physically embodied cognitive structure that is able to, is not limited in its, sensory perceptions it's not limited in the amount of memory and the amount of computations i mean all of us are limited beings all of us evolved under constraints of time and energy and everything else we see a tiny little narrow slit in the electromagnetic spectrum we have a few other things like uh, chemical senses of, of things that are right there on your you know on your tongue and on your fingers and so on uh and we have a little bit of memory and, you know, we have this wet, squishy substrate that's very error prone and needs to be constantly maintained and all our memories have to be actively, you know, sort of re rewritten and all that. Uh, under those, and, and we were evolved under specific pressures, uh, the, under those conditions, who could possibly think that that we are not living in some sort of very specific representation of, of reality that uh, is is limited in many ways? Now, that's not to say it isn't adaptive and that's not to say that it's, um, you know, sort of, well, I mean, okay. So, so Don, Don Hoffman would say that in many ways it is completely wrong. I, you know, I, I, th I think there's probably some truth to that, but, but in other ways, I think the, the big uh, kind of lesson from all this is that we are all a brain in a vat. Of course we are. We are, we are a brain sitting inside uh, you know, this, this, we think this thing that gives us various stimuli, we try to make the best sense of it that we can. Um, and creatures will adapt to, this is why you can do sensory substitution and sensory augmentation and why you can have uh, neurons in the dish that play pong. Uh, these systems will try to make sense of whatever world 
they're given in whatever configuration they have, and we do the same. So yeah, absolutely, it's an illusion, but it's not an illusion in the sense that uh, there is some other way to you know sort of have perfect direct, uh, not not for us anyway, uh, perfect direct um, uh, perception of some underlying reality. It just to me when we say it's an illusion or a simulation, it just acknowledges the fact that we are finite, limited beings whose job it is to make the best sense we can using the hardware that we have of what's been going on up until now and what we predict is going to be going on. I don't know of another story that could possibly make sense. So, so I, so I think it's, I think it's both. I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think there, there's an illusion going on. Of course there is. And at the same time, I think we are uh, conscious of that. Um, yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think we can, we can do well by, by learning how that, that mapping works. Do you think that's your, the science behind everything you, you guys are doing at Levin Lab and everywhere else within this team now, I would say this diverse intelligence team uh, aligns with Julia Tononi and, and Eric Hall's, their, their work on integrated information theory. At what point do you think those collide? Yeah, I mean, we we use quite a bit of that. So so Eric worked in our Allen Center for some years, and uh, we uh, we worked together on a bunch of stuff. And using, um, I, I think these these metrics of of integrated information, whether Julio's or somebody else's, uh, are yeah, they're they're a very useful mathematical tool to begin to understand uh, one aspect of that integration. I think it's it's really foundational. I think I think their work. Just I I can't say enough about how um you, you know and I'm not saying it's correct in all the details necessarily but but I'm just saying this idea that that they were able to move what used to be a philosophical question that is you know are 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 higher levels in in systems real or or can everything be reduced to the lower level the fact that that's been argued about for I don't know how many hundreds of years the fact that they were able to move that from a philosophical question to a practical question that there's now a downloadable toolkit that you can install and run and get an answer for your system as to which level does the most causal work it's it's one of the most profound things you know how often do you see a philosophical question like that reduced in the, in the right way uh, to to software that you can actually get a, a, an answer out of it right i think that's i think that's just incredibly profound and, and we're using some of those tools so we're analyzing uh you know calcium signaling in our xenobots and and bioelectrical signaling in in cells trying to decide uh, how many of them belong to a single embryo and all that kind of stuff so yeah it's it's already it's already collided yeah, no, I, mean, I think it's just beautiful the way you guys are taking philosophy so seriously and applying it into the science. It, it, it's, it opens up the door to so much more and, and so much more creative thinking in general. It doesn't just box you into this general scientific mindset. I mean, even though I am someone very much in the field of science, I mean, it's always great to, to explore these ideas differently. And you mentioned that you're, you're trying to go beyond this and you, you sort of spoke about it as it's a slightly primitive idea at this point, but your tame idea you said you want to move beyond this at this point. And, and when you first came up with it, it was sort of slightly more basic. What did you mean by that? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I, I mean, well, there's, a, there's, there's, okay. On the one sense, in the one sense, it needs much more development. So, so that was just the first paper I have, you know, Tame 2.0 is, is on my calendar for, you know, to do sometime this fall. And uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more coming. So, so fleshing out the details, making the cognitive light cone more quantitative. There's, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of development that needs to happen. This is just the first step. I, in no way am I claiming that any of this is, is a definitive treatment. These are, these are just the first steps. Um, but there's also another sense, which is, which is interesting, which is that, um, and it's funny, a lot of people, actually catch on to this without my having talked about it, you know, publicly, which is, I, I get a lot of emails from therapists and psychoanalysts and people who do counseling and things like that. And it's, and I'm, I, you know, I'm always interested, like, uh, how did you like, what, what, you know, I, I don't work in those fields. I don't have anything to say about that specifically. How did you find me? And they all read this tame stuff and the boundary of the self, and they can sort of feel, they can, they feel the connections. And, and what I can say about it is, is this, the, the tame framework, is fleshed out in terms of in terms of an engine. It's it's focused as from an engineering perspective. And the thing about the engineering perspective is control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict and control the system. And now, I mean, that's very useful because now I can ask questions. You know, do I treat it like a bowling ball? And then I can use certain set of tools 
or is it more like a mouse and then I use a different set of tools or is it something in between like the cells or an autonomous vehicle and I use different set of tools and so on. But all of that is uh, framed in terms of control. Now, an, an uncharitable view of this would be, uh, and, and, and some people who are you know, in the humanities could, could see this, they would look at this and say, well, control is great for the kind of left side of that spectrum. But when you get towards the, the you know other humans and 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 the you know other animals and so on, control isn't the right way to think about it because because you know you you can't just be thinking about how I'm going to how am I going to control all the all the people you know around me right that like that's yeah and and so and so the thing is that I think I'm, uh, uh, the next version of this which which I'm working on but but the early one had to come out first to kind of nail this part down is. It's not just about control. Control is again this this slider that go. There's a there's a uh, a spectrum of agency, and the more you go to the right, the more control is in terms of in in terms of this one directional you know um, relationship with the system becomes a bi directional relationship where I get something back from the from the agency of the system I'm working with. Not so much you know he, you're not going to hear much for, about the hopes and dreams of the bowling ball, but by the time you get to the right side, you're really having relationships that are very bi directional. It's not about control. It's about it's but but it, but again everything starts out with this with this more general question of what's the right way to relate to that system and and another way to think about it a very simplistic sort of uh way to think about it is you know you're going to mars you're going to spend some amount of time there maybe the rest of your life what kind of system do you want with you do you want a roomba do you want a dog do you want a human do you want some sort of superhuman whose goals just imagine uh you know, uh, if there was some other creature who had these galactic level goals that you couldn't even begin to understand, like, would that be fun? Um, you know, and so and so you can think about having a kind of impedance match in relationships, right? Where your if your cognitive light cones are completely out of whack with each other, it 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 doesn't tend to work too well. And you can think about you can think about marriage and you know, sort of what what is the kind of system that and and then you can think about uh interesting things like uh for 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 example. Uh, people are now working on a uh, proof of humanity certificates. This is because of AI, right? And so you want to, when you're dealing with, you know, s something or, or someone or a work product or whatever, you, you know, some people want to know that it was made by, by a human or that it is a human or whatever. And so you can ask yourself, I think that's a very interesting question. You can ask yourself, what is it that you want this proof of humanity certificate to actually guarantee? Right. What, what, what do you want? And so you can say, and so some people are, uh, some people will say, um, Oh, it's terrible that humans are uh, changing themselves, and you know, in the future we'll have uh, I don't know chips implanted and, and you know wheels and tentacles. I don't know what the hell we'll have, and you know, and 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 so some people say that's terrible. So so one question is humanity. Does that mean I have a standard human anatomy? I, I don't really care about that, right? That doesn't, you know, maybe other people do. I don't care about that at all. Uh, or some people say, well, what's important about being human is the is the genome, you know, the human genome. I, I, I don't care about the genome at all. And so and so now and so now do you care about when you know if you're gonna marry someone or you're gonna spend some time on Mars with someone, what is it that you really want? You know, what what is the what is the and, and I think what you really want is um you want to make sure that your uh cognitive light cone and specifically the the compassion part of the cone matches. You want to know that this being has the capacity to care about the same amount of stuff that you care about. So if it's, you know, if it's a, if it's a Roomba or it's a, or, or it's a, you know, it's a cat or a snake or something like that's better than nothing, but it's really not sufficient. And you want at least that. So, so when I see proof of humanity, here's what I want. I want at least a standard modern humans level of possible compassion. I want somebody that is capable of caring about this roughly the same amount or, or more, more is always good, uh, you know, uh, about the same amount of stuff. And so, and so that's what, the, to me, that's what this is about. It isn't just about engineering control. It's about having the right impedance match for a relationship, you know, and you want something that, uh, has the same existential. This is what I think. This is just, you know, it's just my, my, my own thinking is that, you want something that has the same existential problems that you do. You, if, if a system like, uh, you know, if you had some sort of um, uh, robotic 
system that didn't have to put itself together during embryogenesis, never had to decide where do I end and the outside world begins. It doesn't have any issues of of um, needing to keep itself up with metabolism or it'll die, you know, things like that. The systems that didn't go th- that that don't go through the same existential uh, questions and concerns that that we go through are not ideal for that kind of relationship. This is this I think is what people are really. I don't I don't think they really mean the genome. I don't think they mean the anatomy. You know, I said to um, other people who. Uh, who who do talk about you know anatomy and, and and things like that? I'll say, look, your spouse comes home one day and they say, um, you know what? I've had uh, I've had some toes uh, swapped. Uh, you know, I went to the doctor. They had to have some. My my toes are bionic. All right, like who cares? And then they say, well, actually, you know what? I also had a bunch of other internal organs swapped out. Like, yeah, all right. Uh, you know, at what point? At what at what point do you say, okay, now now this is no longer like you know, I'm no, we're no longer married. You know, this is not going to work. And and I don't think it has anything to do with your genome or or, or what the anatomical structures you have. But once you get to the point where uh, it's 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 that amount of um, care, uh, you know, the, the the cone of caring and compassion that you can generate. If that if if that isn't there, and if this like these fundamental being able to have the same existential you know concerns and and preferences and all that, that that's that's where it's at. That that's where you want to have a match. So so I think it's about relationships, not just about control. I mean, I love that. But do, do you ever get concerned with with the possibility that perhaps let's say a just trying to think of the most the random example. Let's say you've got a communist and a and someone who's completely on the other side of the fence. At, at what point would you say social bio or psychosocial aspects would play a big role in differentiating a human at that regard? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Say again. So let's say two people who've got fundamentally different um, social views uh, in terms of trying to live together, show compassion, show love, the diversity, let's say, of values. How would it Im- implicate? How would, what what philosophical or scientific implications would this have on the on your framework? I see. Uh, so so my framework isn't a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition. So so it still might be that your cognitive light cones are similar in size, but you're not a good match because you have diver- you know radically divergent political views or something. I mean that's possible. I'm not I'm not saying that it's sufficient to have. Uh, you know, but 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 on the other hand, if you think about it, uh, and I don't know, I, I guess different people will answer this differently. But if you were going to Mars and you had a choice between going with something that had no political views, a, a toaster, and and that's it, and you would never, you you couldn't agree on anything, but you also wouldn't disagree on anything, right? You 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 know, it's a it's a toaster oven, uh, or you're going with someone who has your level of uh, of cognitive light cone, but they they have a different perspective on things and. You know, is that better or worse? You know, after uh, how, how much time do you want to spend with a person who disagrees with you versus with with something that has zero opinions at all? I, I don't know. Some people might prefer the toaster, I suppose. I, I don't know. But but the, the point is, um, I think it's a I think it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient one to get along. But 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 it's and, and of course, I mean, I what do I know? about? I'm not telling anybody how to get along with anybody, but I'm just saying that that uh, the idea of how do you optimally and ethically relate to another system requires you to ask uh, what level of cognition it has and that will determine what types of interactions you're likely to have you know and i think at that point the william james definition plays a huge role i mean that goal directedness of trying to accomplish something together plays a fundamental role in this yep. it'll obviously bring the bring the units together when we're thinking when we Talk about Mars and this this potential. When you look at Mars as a place for us to go, I mean, just off topic a little, uh, from a de- from a developmental biology background for someone so well versed in in biology, what are your thoughts on that? Ah, oh, boy. Well, this is outside my expertise. I don't. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know anything really about uh, about that stuff. Um, I, I suppose. I suppose the only kind of generic thing I can say is that. My gut feeling is that biology is incredibly adaptable, and that with some help, uh, I you know I, I I guess I guess all I'm saying is I you know there there are some people that say that fundamentally we are never going to be able to live in these environments for various reasons, and just my my gut feeling is that that's wrong. I, I think I think we will, but 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 I have no expertise in this whatsoever. So there's you know take that with uh, every grain of salt. Uh, Mike, when 
when we try our best to define selves, um, intelligence, cognition, we're obviously faced with these barriers and, and it becomes clear that there's no the sort of phase transitions that are occurring. I mean, this is clearly a continuum. When, when you look at certain neuro, certain computational theories and, and mathematical concepts, they, they often, with, when it comes to computing and artificial intelligence, they, they seem to claim that there are certain phase transitions that occur that make certain systems more complex than others within the mathematics. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any opinion on that? Because I know certain mathematicians who often say this, that there is a certain phase transition that occurs here. Does it apply to biology or life? Yeah, yeah, no, the, well, there, there, are, there certainly seem to be phase transitions in mathematics and logic. I mean, one of the few definitive kinds of uh, phase transitions that I know of are some is some, something like a logical proof, mm. right? If like you know, let's say it's got three, you know, three three parts to the proof. As soon as you have all three parts, that thing is locked solid. And if you don't have the three parts, you have nothing, and there is no in between, right? I mean, there's fuzzy logic and stuff like that, but 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 under under standard uh, logic, uh, you know, you either have you you either have the argument or you don't, and and that's that. So 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 I think. There are things like that. And, and I'm not even, you know, I'm not even against phase transitions in biology. I mean, I do think the, fa the fact that there's a continuum doesn't mean that, you know, we don't have kind of cognitive capacities that a, that a sea slug is just not going to have, right? I mean, that's, you know, we, 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 we do. But, uh, but the question is, I, I'm not even sure what, I mean, what, what, is, a, what is a good description of a phase transition. So, so imagine, uh, you know, you have some sort of parameter and as you change the parameter, eventually, boom, something happens, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you can ask yourself, what's a good description of that? Because if, if I can say in detail exactly why it is that at a certain level of that parameter, something happened, then it's not really an emergent phase transition because you have the smooth story. You can say, well, it was here, here, and at this point now it's here and so on. Okay. But if you don't do that, then you really don't have any explanation at all. So, so what is, you know, what, what is an ideal, ex should, should, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that once you have a detailed explanation of it, it seems to kind of go away in some important sense. And so from that perspective, it's almost like a it, it's almost like a statement of um, I don't want to say a statement of ignorance, but but it's a it's it's a statement that works well on one level, and then like many things, disappears when you sort of look at look much closely, much more closely. And the other thing is for for a lot of these things, the scale is very relative. So for so so for example, um, somebody will say you know the human brain does this and that, and I'll say okay, so so in embryonic development. You know, you used to be one cell. When when did this human brain, you know, show up? And I'll say, well, when the you know, what I don't know, I'm making this up, but like when the frontal cortex developed, say, okay, but that takes months. So like when exactly? And they say, well, so right. So 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 on. A, so you step back and you and and you and it certainly looks sharp, but when you zoom in a little bit, you find out that yeah, every second of development, some cells are dividing and some other stuff is happening. Like it's a, you know, if you zoom in, it's a nicely smooth process and there's nowhere that you can just draw a sharp line. So, so that's another thing. I think that these, um, these phase transitions are kind of, uh, they're, they're in the eye of the beholder. They, they, they appear depending on what mm, uh, formalism you're using to understand them, right? If you're using binary logic, then you'll get some. And if you're using fuzzy logic, you may not. Uh, and they depend on what the time scale that you're using. At one time scale, it looks super sharp. At another time scale, it's like this long, tedious, gradual process. So yeah, it's like like many things. I think it's in the eye of the beholder. Do you think one of those one of the concepts that we often talk about within understanding the concept of self, consciousness, etc., that might also benefit from this continuum of viewpoint would be language? Do you think that because because a lot of people often say that look there'd be no way for them to sort of articulate any of these thoughts without this this phenomenon uh, this phon phenomenon of language w what does your work have anything to do with this at any point do you feel like it addresses that yeah yeah interesting question um I don't, yeah i don't have enough expertise in language specifically to, to to say much with certainty um 
put it this way, uh, I, I in, as, as much as I like, uh, you know, non neural cognition and, and the wisdom of the body and all those things, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any reason and I've never claimed that the other organs in the body use language in the way I mean, I do think they solve problems, I think they have memories, I think they have preferences and so on. But I don't have any reason to think they use language in the way that the brain does. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying there's no, uh, I, I don't know of any evidence for it. So it's entirely possible that one of the nice things about brains and maybe, you know, uh, human brains in particular is, is this capacity for a formal for formal language in the way that people who study, you know, the, um, the, the, the logic of language and so on, uh, uh, can generate. And I'm not sure that other organs can do it. So, um, but, but again, that's not, you know, not really my expertise. <clears throat> so your work, as we know, it touches on so many different fields. At some point it goes into limb regeneration. I mean, your understanding of biology and regenerative, regenerative medicine at this point is becoming so spectacular. Um, Anything within that sphere that you particularly excited about at this point? Well, uh, well, I'm excited about a lot of lot of the empirical work that we're doing. I mean, my goal, uh, among among other goals, one of my fundamental goals is to impact human medicine. So mm -hmm. at some point, I, I would love it if 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 some of this stuff got into the clinic while while I'm still around. I mean, I, th I think it I think it will get there no matter what. But but it'd be nice to it'd be nice to see it. Um, we are working on uh, bioelectric approaches to limb regeneration. Where uh, you know I, I never give timelines, so I can't uh, I can't know ahead of time what's going to happen. But we're we're in mice now. Um, we're working in, uh, uh, we've got some work on bioelectrics of cancer in human cells now. So, you know, kind of moving, moving from frog on onwards. Uh, yeah. Very excited about that stuff. I'm very excited about uh, the work on um, uh, synthetic organisms. We'll have some really cool uh, work on this coming out in the next probably month or two, um, following up on the, on all the Xenobot uh, stuff that we've done. Um, well, yeah. I feel like there's a huge amount. Sorry. No, sorry, I was just saying I'm looking forward to that. Continue. I was listening. Yeah, yeah, there, there, yeah. There's going to be there, there's some there's some amazing stuff in review now, and 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 lots of other things uh, that are in the pipeline that are going to kind of uh, come 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 out after. I'm yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. It's it's pretty you know it's uh, the 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 last uh, ten percent of any paper is always the hardest you know. So so you you know you make a fundamental uh, finding and then you you know sort of flesh it out and you kind of already see where what the story is. But then getting into the point where all the sort of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and you can actually get it out that takes takes forever and you know that always that, that always feels like a long time but yeah it, it, it'll get there when you got into this did you ever feel at any point that you'd be because moving from this physiological perspective has not taken you into the psychological era like domain when you get these emails from people asking about these the implications of computational boundaries of self and how it can affect us psychologically did you ever think this would happen did you well were you planning on that or is it just something that's occurred over time well, uh, so there's two pieces to that. The piece, uh, so so from from day one, and I'm talking about when I was very very young, uh, these were the issues that I was interested in. So I, I was always interested in issues of mind and matter and 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 machines and and programming and living organisms and relationships between alien beings and all this kind of stuff. Um, was always interested in that. So I'm not at all surprised, although incredibly pleased that the empirical work has actually sort of dovetailed with that, 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 that doesn't always happen. And that, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a, um, the, the thing that, the thing that surprises me still to this day is that any of this, uh, is actually working to the level that, um, people are interested in it. So I kind of assumed when I was younger that, what would happen is uh, I would pursue these things on my own. I would be sort of interested in it, but that fundamentally no one would ever pay attention. None of it would would develop to the point where anybody would care. And I would code, I would write code for a living, which I used to do, and you know, and that 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 worked fine. Um, that I would just kind of write code for a living and think about these things in my spare time, and and you know, maybe write some some stuff that nobody would ever read. So, uh, and, you know, and I, I was told uh, many times in, in grad school that I'd soon be, you know, kicked out and, and that would be that. And then I, and then I would go back to coding. And so, so I don't know, to, to this day, I find it, I sometimes, I sometimes just kind of stop and think, I'm an actual scientist. Like, that's crazy to think about. Like, and we've done some things that are, that are kind of cool and some people care about it. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm still amazed by it every day. I mean, so 
some of the work you're doing is it's it's so incredible. I mean, the last time we spoke, I remember saying so many people <coughs> have had a Nobel Prize already, and 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 it's and you're just at the tip of the iceberg of all the work you're currently doing. So it's there's so much more to discover. There's so much more to see. It it must be super exciting to see it from your perspective because you're watching this happen moment from moment. We're just seeing glimpses of. Of, of the spectacular rise of, of wonderful new science. It must be completely mind boggling to watch it from your perspective. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling. And I think this, this is also maybe a good time to mention that, and this is this is really key, is that it's not just me, right? So 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 my group, um, I mean, I, I write some of the crazy stuff, but but the rest of, uh, there's, there's, there's 30 people here. And so they do a, a huge amount of the work. Uh, they're, they're, they're brilliant and, and very hardworking. Um, and it would absolutely not happen without them. So, so it's not just me. I'm sort of the, the, the tip of the spear of, of, a, of an amazing group that uh, I'm, I'm super fortunate to work with. Um, yeah, and, and, and it is mind-boggling. You know, I see stuff on, on an almost daily basis that, you know, people show me data and, and I see things. I'm like... You know, uh, just just amazing. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, what can I say? It's the it's the best job in the world. Uh, that is, is zero complaints. I mean, there, there are a lot of hard parts, and you know, people who criticize academia. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of difficult parts and a lot of things that are um, that require uh, lots of effort and uh, are unfortunate in some cases and, and probably should be fixed. But in the end, uh, I I don't know what else would be a more fun thing to be doing. <clears throat> I've got. I mean, it's it's truly spectacular, Mike. Just keep it up from my side. I've got a couple of questions here, and they're just very like short phrases because I, I came across that video of you from the well the other day where can cells think? I found it. It's a very wonderful video. But just to answer that question, can cells think? What are, what are your thoughts on? That? Well, uh, I mean, uh, you. It depends on the definition of think, but I I think in uh, for any useful definition, I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, we, we can we can come up with definitions that exclude them in principle and we can stick to, you know, somebody somebody could say that that for them thinking has to be some sort of high order, self-aware. I know that I know, you know, whatever. Um, I I don't particularly think that's that's a you know, that's a good definition. I, I, I would like a more expansive definition um, and, and under under those kind of definitions. Yeah, I think I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. What is the self? Well, um, uh, and and I'm not claiming to have uh, the I'm not claiming there's one uh, one correct definition, but I'll but I'll, I'll sort of try to try to work up a a useful one. I, I think I think a self is a model created by either some sort of third person uh, observer. So that could be a scientist, that could be a conspecific, that could be a parasite, that could be a, a whatever so some some other some other observer or by the system itself. So a self is a is a is a model and it's a bundle that that model is a bundle of a few things. It's a guess as to where the boundary is between a system and the outside world. It's a guess about the problem spaces in which that agent operates. It's a guess about the size of the cognitive light cone that that system might have. And it's a guess about the competencies that that system has to get its goals accomplished, so the IQ level, of, so to speak. And so that 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 bundle of things is what a self is. And the system itself has that you know may may have even if it's not second order conscious, meaning that it there may no the system may not have the capacity to think, gee, I'm a self and I meet these criteria like humans can do that, but but many systems can't. But that's okay. They still they still have. Uh, internally, they still have a model that allows them to g get around the world by, uh, by, by, by being able to demarcate themselves from the rest of it. And that's what it takes, you know. Um, I, wrote, I wrote this down. It says, man, a machine. Because I know you quoted, um, it was a paper published, I can't remember by who. Man, a machine. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let me tree. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I wrote, man, a machine. Expand. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, okay, uh, a, a lot of people are really worried uh, about machine-like analogies for humans, and and, and I get it. Uh, it's it's one way to be mistaken. If you if you use for a system like a human, if you use techniques 
that are appropriate for the left side of that spectrum where you're dealing with um, you know mechanical clocks and things like that yeah you're you're going to make uh, you're you're going to have a very suboptimal interaction you're not going to be able to predict and control much you're going to make many ethical lapses as as we've done uh, in the past um but at the same time if you know uh if if you believe that the human body and mind don't obey various laws is the, which is basically a definition of what the machine is right it's a uh, I, I think a reasonable definition of a machine is that it's a, it's a system that is rationally understandable because it obeys various laws and thus thus it can be put to various uses and, and interacted with and so on if you don't think that uh, humans have machine-like aspects you are also going to not get very far in understanding what we are and how to relate to each other. The, the difference is to understand what kind of machine we are. We are amazing, uh, remarkable, ethically important, uh, uh, morally valuable spiritual machines. That is what we are. And um, we're trying to trying to say that we're not machines is is uh, I think silly. But the real question is what kind of machine not not the kind that that we've been making since you know since uh you know, the early days of of mechanical clocks and things and i think that um you know sometimes uh uh when 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 i when we talk about this stuff in in uh, if i give a talk to a philosophy group or something one of my first slides is this this guy and it was it, it's he, he was just a you know just a um a, a fan who sent me a picture uh and i and i use this now he had some surgery on his arm and what you see is, and this this kind of gross, but don't worry, like the picture is way way grosser. But I like to use it to sort of shock people out of this thing. Uh, imagine imagine a human arm, and it's and it's cut down the middle and opened up like this. And there's a metallic sort of thing, and it's got a bunch of screws in it. And the surgeon is in there putting in, you know, he's literally using a socket wrench, and he's screwing a bunch of screws in, and he screwed it to the bone. And there's some electrodes and a bunch of other stuff. Now, none of this would be possible if we weren't to some degree, a machine. That that much is clear. When, when, when by the time you're using a socket wrench on on something, it, it it's partly a machine. Now now that's not the same. Now, now when that same person goes to uh, therapy afterwards and you know and 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 does psychoanalysis, you're not using the socket wrench at that point. It's a different set of tools. So so that's the time to 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 not act like a simple machine. But you know you kind of see when you see that picture, like you can you can sort of be philosophically outraged at being called a machine. But if you fall off your bike and you need a metal thing put into your arm, this is what it's going to look like. And it's going to be very machine like. So um, and somebody else is going to get an implant in their brain that um, secretes uh, serotonin at the right time and helps, you know, uh, overcome some sort of, um, you know, um, neurotransmitter um, imbalance or something. These machine aspects are really useful. Let's not pretend they don't exist. I mean, I completely agree with you. Every time if, if, if we're in an orthopedic surgery, you, it's, it's so it's so strange to see it all the time. The way orthopedic surgeons literally look like mechanics, it, it, it's it's uncanny. It's strange. They're with hammers, drills. It's it's very mechanistic. It's it's almost yep. impossible to not. Yeah, it, but but and and yet though the, the the second part to so that's the first part to this. The second part to this, which which I is always interests me, is you've done all this stuff, and then often the next step is well now we let the body heal. Well, right. And so now, now, like, like, like it's going to adjust to all this stuff, all these different things are going to happen. And like, I'm not touching, I'm, I'm, there's nothing I can do about that. You need six months for the body to heal. Yeah. And, and during those six months, you're, you're literally relying on the agency of the cells and tissues to do what they need to do. They're sitting next to titanium now, and that's okay. They'll figure it out. And, you know, there's now some weird electrode that's pacing something. Yeah, it's fine. The cells will, you know, and, and after six months, the person's like, oh, I feel much, you know, my, it's been a tough six months, but I feel much better. Well, well, well what happened dur during that time? Right. It's not, it's not us sitting there micromanaging this thing. It's, it's, you're counting on the body to, uh to do what it knows how to do in fact a lot of things that we don't know how to do so so it's it's both sides right it, it's it's a machine it has machine-like aspects and it also has agency and it also has various con competencies and and it's okay that it's both you know it's it's it, it's okay i like that i like that second part it does it is a good way to think about it um it really does help you to s sort of think of that concept more i wrote here um cognition all the way down what about metacognition all the way down yeah. Um, well, uh, so I'll give you a story. Uh, Chris Fields uh, first put me onto this uh, years ago. Um, 
you got a bacterium and the bacterium is measuring the local sugar concentration uh, or you know some other nutrient or something and uh and and it goes up the gradient but if that bacterium in, encounters some sugar that's actually poisoned it's it's screwed because because all it does is it has a first order imperative to to kind of increase the the sugar concentration now the version of metacognition in that system would be this you need a system and, and this apparently does exist in bacteria already you need a system that doesn't just measure the sugar directly what it measures is the outcome of the output of your metabolism so that's metacognition because <clears throat> what you're asking is how am i doing like how's my metabolism doing you and and it's one level above because I can't tell you how much sugar there is. I don't know how much sugar there is, but I can tell you that your metabolism is going great, or I can tell you that your metabolism is going terrible. And that's the sort of thing that being able to ask questions about yourself and your own status state and how things are going is really critical. And I would think that that is the beginning of advanced metacognition is just having circuits that are not measuring aspects of the outside world. They're measuring aspects of, of you and how you're doing and that might be you know in bacteria it might be the output of your metabolism and in humans it might be um the uh, uh how you how, how, how you're doing in some sort of social standing or you know how, how am i doing in my in my tribe and what do people think of me and all that stuff so so you know um or am i learning calculus fast enough or whatever right so so but but all of that is it, it all shares the same underlying concept is that the sensors are not pointing outwards they're pointing inwards some of these some of these comments I wrote are quite ridiculous. For example, I wrote, um, "If you regenerate a brain of someone at some point, if you let's say your technology reaches that point, would regenerating a brain that's not technically injured be akin to creating a clone of the brain?" <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think that uh, our the the reason all these puzzles. You know, it's like the old, um, I mean, in philosophy has had this for, for decades, the, the the broken transporter experiment, right? So you get in the transporter and it normally just sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, recreates a copy of you somewhere else and it destroys the original and that's fine. But but one day it malfunctions and it forgets it. It just doesn't destroy the original. And now, my God, who who is the real me? You got clones, right? And there's a Star Trek episode and everything else. So, um, uh, I, I mean, all of these, all of these issues uh, strike us as problems because our vocabulary is bad. You know, we, we, we don't have the right vocabulary for this. It, we, we can't even handle like, what happened to you to to the to the you that was a child? Where where did he go? Like, is he still here? Is he not here? We we don't you know these binary this binary terminology. You know, you don't have to get really weird with with and cloning and transporters and whatnot to already have this problem. We 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 already have this issue that uh, we change and uh, as a you know over time we change and I, I don't know if I'm the same person that I was. It doesn't the question doesn't really doesn't really make any sense. But on a practical level. Could you, you know, could you clone, you know, I I, I suspect, I, I don't know, but I suspect that cloning in the traditional sense where you go from the egg onwards, I don't, I don't think you would recover much mental, uh, you know, content, but there's a different version, which is what happens in planaria. So in planaria, if I train a flatworm on something and then I cut off its head and I keep the tail and the tail regrows a brand new brain, that new brain will remember the original information. Okay, the McConnell discovered that in the 60s, we demonstrated in 2013, I mean, it does work. So that means that uh, at least in some species, some of the information can be stored elsewhere in the body and imprinted onto a brand new brain that forms because they have no behavior until the brain shows up. The tail just sits there doing nothing until the brain shows up. So could, you know, could you spread that information to two brains? Sure. In planaria, you could cut a worm into 10 pieces. They will all recover the information. And now you've got 10, what, clones kind of, uh, you know, who's the original worm? I, I don't know what, to, yeah, I don't know what to do with that question. I don't, I don't think it's, you know, I don't, I don't think it's particularly uh, uh, realistic anymore, but, um, but, but, but that technology, you know, I, I don't know if humans do this or not. Um, the closest, the closest to this, the closest data to this in humans that I know of has to, and this is very, um, 
I don't know if preliminary is the right word, but but it's you know there there aren't good studies on this yet. Uh, although I think at some point there will be, <clears throat> but there have been anecdotal reports of um, personality transfer during heart lung transplants, and um, and it's interesting. You don't hear it from liver transplants, you don't hear it from kidney transplants, but when you talk to doctors who do um, heart lung, and maybe you know more about this than I do, but when you when you when you talk to to transplant surgeons that do heart lung, they will tell you that they often warn. Uh, recipients that you can have personality changes. And there have been some reviews of individual cases where they're not just personality changes, they're personality changes that look an awful lot like the donor. And and so I think, I don't know if this is real. The ends on this stuff is quite small still, I think, and it's mostly anecdotal. So this could all be not, you know, nonsense, but, but, but based on the plenary work, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the question of, what happens to, I mean, there's another version of your question, which is when we figure out brain, uh, brain uh, regeneration and repair, if you've got a 60 or 70 year old patient with, uh, you know, decades of specific memories, and then you seed their brain with new stem cells or something, or you trigger regeneration of new neurons, what happens to their personality? You know, what happens to their memories? I, I suspect it'll be fine based on planaria. I actually think it'll be fine, but, but we don't know. We don't know how that plays out in, in, in mammals yet. Uh, here I wrote teleonomy and teleology, because I know there's, you talk about that teleophobia, and I'd love for you to explore that, because I think it's pretty cool when you, because a lot of scientists try and avoid this topic with a passion, and, and the fact that you're able to communicate this, because I'm often fascinated by this thought process. Well, yeah. Uh, so, so I call it teleophobia, uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, scientists really would like to get away from it. Um, it, th th that made sense prior to, let's say, the 1940s, because prior to that, the only things with goals were uh, humans and some some animals. And uh, before that, it was only, you know, it was thought to be just humans and angels and, and nothing else. So, OK, um, you as a, as a scientist, if you weren't working on humans uh, and, and maybe some great apes, you you really wanted to avoid any talk of goals because it, it you know you felt that it was taking you backwards into some sort of pre-scientific uh, you know kind of uh, religious worldview but since the 40s and there on we've had a, a a mature science of machines with goals it's called cybernetics we, we have control theory it's not scary anymore it's okay now it doesn't have to be magic it doesn't have to be angels it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be you know the the the, the spirit uh it's okay. We have machines with goals now. Your thermostat has goals, little tiny ones, like very modest little tiny goals, and and it's okay. And and we now have a, a, a principled, quantitative way of dealing with all kinds of unusual things with goals. So I, I think teleology is completely fine. Now, um, I sometimes use the word teleonomy, and the difference is so 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 teleology is supposed to be goal directedness. Teleonomy is supposed to be apparent goal directedness. In, I, I recently wrote a chapter for a book on teleology, and the editors of, of the book uh, com complained about the use of teleonomy because many people use that as a, as a way to um, back out of the claim, right? So they say, it's not really teleology, it just looks like teleology. So we're going to call it teleonomy. Teleonomy are, is, are things that look like they're goal-directed, but they're not really. Um, and that's and that's not my point at all. My point isn't to soften it in the slightest. I, I'm a hardline teleologist. Uh, but what I think is cool about teleonomy is that it reminds us that everything, including teleology, is a lens from the perspective of some observer. That's what I think the word apparent should be doing. And I, I don't know that that's what um, I actually don't remember who coined teleonomy, but but um, uh, I don't think that's what they had in mind. But but I think that's what it should be. I think I think what's cool about it is that it reminds us that when you see a system and you say, oh, that system is or isn't pursuing a specific goal, you are an observer who's making a hypothesis. Some other observer may make some other hypothesis. And in some amount of time, you will find out who was right and who was wrong based on who had the better science and technology come out of it. And, and it's an empirical question, but 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 it's not a it's not an objective thing where you can say right away, this does or doesn't have 
teleology, you're an observer and you're making that claim from a particular perspective. So, so I like that about teleonomy, but, but my point isn't to try to soften it at all or try to pretend it's, you know, some sort of um, as if, uh, you know, thing. I think, I think it's real. I think it's absolutely real. At some point when, when I read that, I, I wrote a note saying, um, what would be the teleos you think is possible? Aside from the goal-directed nature of how we behave right now, do you perceive a future where perhaps the goal-directed is, is taking us somewhere? Because I often think about perhaps maybe the artificial intelligence is the way forward in terms of how we design intelligence moving forward. Do you think that that's a big factor for our teleological progression into the future? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood that correctly, but what I what I hear you asking is if there's some sort of uh, goal directedness in the large scale patterns of evolution, history, society, whatever. Right? Is that roughly yeah. what, what so? So basically, what do you think is the end goal of this universe? Is there? Is, are we headed somewhere? Yeah, that that's 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 a that's a really deep question. Um, I, I I don't know. I think that it's an empirical question, meaning that I think we should make some hypotheses and uh, pursue some implications of those hypotheses and and test those and see which ones uh, improve our our ability to to act in the world and maybe we'll um, it, you know we can we can talk about um let's let's just talk about evolution per se. So I do think uh, I, 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 I Chris Fields and I wrote a paper once about uh, the the evolution the, the the target morphology of evolution, the idea that, the evolutionary process can have goals in the sense of a dynamical system having attractors to which it tends to fall into. And I mean, this is, you know, um, uh, uh, this is, again, we're not the first person people to say that, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but that's not to say it has some some long range plan in the way in the in the way that humans have plans. That's just to say that there are certain patterns that are likely to uh, reinforce themselves. There's a deeper sense in which, and, and Richard Watson and I, and I still, I still need to ask him this. I have it on my list to discuss this with him at some point. But um, you know, I, I've made the claim that I think that uh, biological evolution by itself doesn't optimize for any of the things we care about. You know, happiness, intelligence, uh, meaning, um, you know, ethical, whatever. No, I, I don't, I don't. And the re and the reason I emphasize that is because people will often say, you know your work is scary because it it might lead to changes in human structure, human life. Whatever. And I try to point out to people that there's nothing magically great about where we are now. Evolution just sort of dumped us in this, you know, it's in, and, and I, and I try to, I try to emphasize that it's sort of like this random meandering search. It settles on things that are just good enough to survive. And our short lifespan, our susceptibility to weird diseases, our propensity to to to, to you know have all these ridiculous uh, accidents befall us, and you know these all these medical these, these crazy medical conditions that people you know email me with all the time. Uh, none of that is optimal. No, nobody sat there and optimized it and said, okay, th this is great. This is how it should be. Now, you scientists don't screw it up. Okay, I think that's completely the wrong way. I th to think about this, I think evolution randomly sort of left us in this position, and now we're the adults in the room, and we need to improve everybody's sort of experience. Um, so, so Richard Watson disagrees. He thinks that uh, evolution isn't uh, as random as I think, and that it does, in fact. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't want to speak for him, so I'm not sure. This is this is a discussion we need to have because I think what I see evolution maximizing is biomass. That's it. Like whatever survives as many units as we can have anything that will will eventually will sort of try to uh uh increase the frequency that it will with which it gets observed in the future so to and 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 to me if you if you start with a with a blank planet you know sort of again sort of star trek scenario where you start with a blank planet but it's pretty you know pretty hospitable to life and you drop off a single seed of some reproduced self-reproducing thing and you come back uh, you know, a hundred million years later, can you say what you're going to find? I, I'm not aware of anything that you can say you're going to find other than the biomass will be huge. This thing is going to proliferate. It's going to find adaptive ways to increase its representation in the environment. And, you, and you're just going to find a lot of complicated living stuff around that that's it i don't know what else you can conclude other than that um yeah i think i think richard disagrees and, and i'd love to i'd love to know if he th you know what the arrow is uh for for evolution 
From, from that perspective, do you think then that technically certain microbes like bacteria are winning this evolutionary game? Um, I, I, th I think you, I think we get to define the game, right? So, so if the game is number of units per, you know, cubic uh, foot or whatever, they're definitely winning, but mm -hmm. I don't, but, but that's not the game we should be playing. I, I don't think, um, you know, so you get to define your own game and then, uh, I mean, that, that's the beautiful part about life is that, uh, it, it tends to pick its own objective function and if and if it's hard to win as a, as a snake then then you might become a bird and you might become something else there are many ways to sort of you know and if you're a human do you really care about the total number of copies of you or of your dna or anything else i don't that, that doesn't seem very exciting to me i i think we should be playing a different game but yeah, um, yeah it, depends. it depends how you see the game these three questions are quite pretty random but uh it's not necessarily a psychological dissection, but it's, it's more from your perspective as a scientist um, and from biology. Who is Mike? What is Mike? And why is Mike? <laughs> oh, oh my God. Uh, I, <laughs> wow. Uh, well, who the who, I, the who, yeah. yeah, who I don't even, I like, I don't know what a, a, a useful answer to that question would even look like. So I don't know. Um, I do. We can skip I, that. I go to the what is Mike. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think of myself very much at all. I sort of. Um, I mostly. It. It. It started when. Um. I. I used to be. Um. Uh. When. When I was a kid, I was. I was very sort of shy, and and I never. You know, I was the kid that never spoke up in high school at all, and was just kind of invisible on. On. You know, by design, and. Uh, and then eventually I realized that as, as the, the whole science thing kept going, I it, like, it was it, like, you have to give talks and whatever. And, and it was very, it was very painful. I never wanted to get up in front of people and whatever it was hard. Um, and then I finally realized that, and this is, this is kind of a simple visualization that I give some of my students that, that have a hard time talking to people is that uh, you, what you do is you, 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 you visualize yourself as glass. You're not there. Nobody's there to look at you. Nobody's interested in you. What what they're interested in is whatever product you're bringing them and uh, what it can do for them. They're all fighting their own battle. Everybody in the audience has their own needs and goals and whatever. And and no one actually cares about you enough to criticize you. You know, they they just they just want to see what you've brought them. And your job is to be a pane of glass. You're completely invisible and to show and to give them the best product that you can give them. It's a new idea. It's something something for you know whatever. And so that's that tends to be how I think about things. Um, I really spend zero time thinking about what I am or who I am, I or 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 what's going on with me. I I mostly just think about um, what's next. And and you know, and this and this and this might be this might be why I like this idea of of the agent as as you know action first is that I mostly just focus on what's the most interesting, helpful, exciting thing we can do next, and how do we do it. Um, so, so I have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer. I don't know how to, how okay. to answer that question. What it, the the what and why part was more in line with in terms of asking you like what is a human in in a sense. So, so what is yeah. like from a biological or mechanical perspective? I would say. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I think I think any any uh, uh, any human is. Uh, an agent with a, a minimum, you know, any, any modern human uh, is an agent with a particular size uh, cognitive light cone with a, with a certain capacity for um, intelligence and compassion. And, uh, you know, how, how they're deploying that, it, there's a very wide variety, obviously, across the, you know, across the world. But um, yeah, that's it. That's it. It's, it's about, it's about this, the scope of your goals and uh and and the 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 intelligence that you have to bring to bear on getting those goals met and and which ones are you pursuing at any given time um, yeah that, like I'm, I'm, I'm sorry i'm not sure if i when you spoke about telios earlier just quickly i'm not sure if you mentioned did, did, did do you feel that at some point there's a cumulative teleological purpose here or or do you feel like each goal-directed activity is happening independent of each other but at some point coalesce in various different ways um you know, I, I think that there is a way that uh, goal-directed units um, combine and, and scale up. But overall, overall, I do think that uh, <clears throat> uh, it is entirely possible to have systems 
in, in fact, this is how biology works. You have systems that have subsystems and each of those subsystems have their own goals and their own agendas and they solve problems in their own space. And all of that is coupled. So um, I, I, I sometimes give a talk called why robots don't get cancer. And it's because <clears throat> we tend to engineer at least for now with part with an architecture that's flat. So your, 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 your robot or your self-driving vehicle may have some intelligence and some goals and whatnot, but all the transistors and everything else that make it up are, are flat. They don't, they don't have an agenda of their own, but in biology, that's not true. So, so we are made of parts that are solving problems and having preferences and, and memories and so on in physiological space, transcriptional space, uh, uh, anatomical space, and so on. So there are goals within goals within goals, and some of them uh, compete and some of them cooperate. And we know from, from basic psychology and therapy and so on that, that humans can have multiple modules with different goals that uh, uh, absolutely do not get along with each other and try to sabotage each other and whatnot. So yeah, it's a, it's a complex society. We, we, are, we are a complex uh, uh, nested, hierarchical, multi-scale nested society of goal-directed agents. Uh, one, one of your infamous lines is at this point, all intelligence is collective intelligence. Um, and I think that's a beautiful concept. Do you, um, as we close off, do you want to touch on that uh, briefly? Yeah, I don't. I don't. It, it doesn't seem controversial to me. Uh, I, I've never seen, and I don't think you could have any kind of intelligence that was some sort of mm, diamond, you know, indivisible single thing. Because because if you were, you couldn't learn. You couldn't uh, have change if you didn't have part. You need parts in order to be able to change, right? To, to 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 learn from experience, you need parts that are going to be doing something different than what they were doing before. I just can't imagine, you know, and 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 people say, you know, the human brain is well, it's a bag of neurons, right? I mean, yes, there's a brain and there's a person there, but but it's also a bag of neurons. And 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 you know, um, I have I have the slide that I show sometimes that um like like uh, Rene Descartes, and and I like Descartes more than a lot of people do nowadays, but 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 he had this um uh he he really liked the pineal gland and he liked the pineal gland because it was only one of them in the brain and he felt that human you know we we have a singular uh integrated consciousness and therefore it it doesn't do to you know to it, it, you, you, if, if you have multiple copies of it in the brain let's say the left and right hemisphere like how, how's that going to work you have a singular consciousness he's ah the, the, the pineal gland there's only one of those that's where consciousness enters the body and the thing is, if he had had good microscopy, he would have looked in that pineal gland and you said, oh, my God, this thing has, you know, millions of cells in it. And if you looked at inside one of those cells, you said, whoa, and this thing has a huge amount of molecular networks and, 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 and whatever. It, there is no single anything anywhere. It's all it's all made of parts until you get down to, well, I don't know, some sort of particles or something. Uh and and so yeah, all, all all intelligent agents are made of parts, and it's always got to be a story about how those parts integrate into a a coherent agent. That's that's oh, that's our goal here is to tell a, a story of scaling up. Well, as we continue to scale up, and you look at artificial intelligence continuously growing, is there any way you'd like us to perceive this problem moving forward, and and just trying to work together with artificial intelligence because it's obviously getting better. It's a different type of intelligence, but yeah, closing remarks on moving future intelligence. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess the the big the big thing I can I can say is just that, or the most general thing, and and I'm I'm gonna write something about this soon, is that I I think most of our concerns about modern AI are just re warmed over uh, sort of uh, restatements of problems that have been with us all along. And that it's just people just the average person is just now realizing that that these are issues, but philosophers have known and the and, and even some, you know, so 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 this idea that uh in the few that 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 we're gonna give rise to something that makes us irrelevant in the future. Like, I mean, that's that's called having kids, right? When when you have kids, you produce something that you work, at least some of us work our butts off to make sure that they're better than we are. And you don't know. And in fact, one of the kind of like standard existential fears is that, yeah, they, they, in their world, we are going to be irrelevant. All the things that we worried about, it's like, hey, old man, we, we, you know, stuff you're talking about is nonsense. We're, we're, we, we care about other stuff now. And so 
Um, right. This is this is. I mean, ever since who was it? Aristotle or somebody? Who, you know, would would write that ah, the youth of today. You know, they don't. You're right. And that was you know back in the classical Greek days. So so yeah, of course we're going to give rise to something that thinks we're we're a bunch of dummies and 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 is going to do something different. Uh, and and I think I, you, you, all, all of that is is just about all of the concerns we have about AI. Are are basically just echoing issues that have always been with us, mm. and uh, you know, and I don't know what the answer is except uh, all I can say is from a personal perspective, I, I'm I'm not super tied to the idea that the Earth has to have a bunch of human DNA uh, running around it. I'm not tied to the fact that we have to be these uh, uh, you know uh, organisms that that are susceptible to a million different diseases and die when we you know in 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 a few decades um if we can make ourselves better great and and let's let's spread uh, let's let's enlarge our cognitive light cones our, our let's enlarge our capacity for compassion and and I, I, you know whatever embodiments people want that's what they should have well mike i mean it's always such a pleasure to chat to you thank you so Likewise. much good to see you thank you so much yeah no, it's, it's wonderful and um when, when i chat to mark next week i'll definitely bring up some of these these aspects of the conversation into it is there anything cool. you want me to ask mark as we go um yeah ask him ask him uh why, let, 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 you know do 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 to him what uh, what what people do to me in email ask him ask him for the meaning of life see what see what he says he, he might actually have a decent answer you know he's a psychoanalyst he, he might actually have an answer i don't have an answer but but he might so. <laughs> no, yeah, i'll definitely bring that up thanks but anything uh, any final words mike anything you want to leave i feel like you've said it all um, no, the only thing the only thing to say is that uh, I will soon uh, um, they're spinning up a WordPress site for me that's going to have a bunch of stuff that uh, doesn't go on my official academic site. Uh, so, you know, essays and, and other stuff. So so keep an eye. I'll, 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 I'll advertise it on Twitter and then there will be a sign up uh, you know, registration thing for people to get notifications and so on. Right. Is, is there working a working link at the moment, a URL? Or should... there, there isn't. It's it's a few days. They tell me it's a few days away. So so I can I can send it to you and then yeah, you know, I'll you can, definitely uh... put a link to that for this episode. Thanks so much, Mike. Once again, it's a pleasure. Great to see you. Great to see you. Take it easy. Mm -hmm.